welcome to Now in Session. Um, this is the second year that we've run this event, I believe, um, so it's great to see such a big turnout tonight. Um, before we continue tonight's proceedings, I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, of the land on which we now meet, the Turrbal and Yagara people, um, and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, Islander people continue to play within the QTM community. Thank you um, for being here tonight. Um, at our first legal information um, night uh, for the education portfolio in 2022. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Courtney Howarth um, and I am the Director of Education um, in the QTLS this year. Tonight, we are excited to welcome four um, highly respected and incredibly inspirational advocates in the legal community. Um, firstly, we've got Tom Sullivan, QC, Keith Wiley, Georgia Kiss, and Kurt McDonald. Sadly, Ms. Lauren Brown, um, who is our fifth speaker tonight, um, cannot make it due to COVID. Um, so she has been prevented from joining us. Um, the order of proceedings tonight will be uh, will begin with a keynote um, from Tom, followed by approximately an hour-long um, question and answer session um, with the entire panel. Finally, depending on um, our guest availability, there may be an opportunity for networking um, and further individual questions um, of our panelists at the conclusion of tonight's event, along with some light refreshments. Um, without further ado, I would now like to welcome um, Tom Sullivan QC, the president of the Queensland Bar Association, to deliver tonight's keynote address. Um, you may have already read a bit about Tom's extensive career in the law, um, but for those who haven't, I'll do a quick intro for you. Um, Tom obtained a Bachelor of Laws with First Class Honours uh, from the University of Queensland. He was awarded the University Medal for his time there. He was a Cambridge Commonwealth Trust scholarship holder and completed his Master of Laws at Cambridge in International and Commercial Law, for which he took a first. He was elected a Scholar of Downing College at Cambridge as a result, um, which entitles him to eat a buffalo once a year at the Scholar's Dinner. Fortunately for the Buffalo, he is yet to take up this ride. <laughs> After college, he was awarded a Pegasus Scholarship from the Inner Temple, Middle Temple and Gray's Inn. In Australia, Tom was an associate to Justice Glenn Williams of the Supreme Court and briefly a solicitor at Faye's Ruthening before coming to the bar. Tom has a busy commercial practice in state and federal courts where he appears at both trial and appellate levels. He also regularly appears in significant commercial arbitrations. Tom's practice is focused on insolvency, construction, banking and corporate, and banking and co corporations law. Tom is particularly experienced in large and complex building and construction disputes. In addition to his work, um, Tom has also been the president of the Queensland Bar Association for the last year and a half. So I'd like you all to make Tom feel very welcome for being here. Thank you. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak this evening. I understand for Courtney, I have a broad remit in what I can speak about, uh, but it's to be no more than 10 minutes, so I'll do my best. <laughs> I've chosen to speak on two broad topics. First, some short reflections on my choice of a life in the bar over life as a solicitor. And secondly, a very few comments on developing your advocacy at the bar. So starting with the first topic, I'm not so old that I can't remember the time when I was in the position that most of you find yourselves in today. That is a student ready to join the workforce. My initial introduction to the law was as a judge's associate to the then Justice Glenn Williams of the Supreme Court. This was a wonderful experience. It gave me a great insight how, as to how the court worked, allowed me to see many of the leading barristers of that era in full flight. I then moved into a one-year article clerkship at Faze Ruthening, which is now called Allen's. I did a Masters of Law overseas after that one year, and then I returned for another six months to Faze Ruthening. The decision was then, do I stay in the firm or do I go to the bar? I had a fairly good idea of a, the life of a solicitor, given that my father and my brother were both solicitors, and ultimately my, solicitor, my sister became a solicitor, 
Both my sister and brother's partners were solicitors as well. I broke them all by marrying a psychiatrist. I met her in a court case. That's a very amusing tale, but I won't tell it tonight. Um, to put it shortly, I did not enjoy solicitors' work. I found in many respects it was relatively tedious. It involved many boring administrative tasks. I can recall sitting in a very small room for a month with a dictaphone dictating a discovery list for a large banking case which I was in. Let's say it broke my soul. <laughs> Further, there was always the underlying pressure that you had to keep the clients on side in order to retain them as clients for the firm. Whilst there were certainly clients that I liked personally, my desire was really only to do the best job I could for them, not necessarily to be their friend or to socialise with them. I suspect, like many of you, I also like the fight. As a solicitor, you really weren't the pupilist, rather you were the water boy or water girl, and that's not the position I wanted to be in. It was a difficult fiscal decision to go to the bar. You have to leave a well-paid, secure job as a solicitor and move into a situation where you will have at varying degrees, immediate costs and expenses that you have to meet with no present cash flow. You do so with the hope that you will succeed, but not the guarantee of that success. I can still remember in my first year, the gut-wrenching feeling of being in chambers with the phone not ringing, sometimes for days. It can be a real feeling that nobody rates you and you will never get another brief. Having confessed all these trepidations and doubts, I can tell you now that I've never regretted, not for a minute, going to the bar rather than staying as a solicitor. I have simply loved the work and for the greater part, enjoyed the people I've worked with. Whilst as young people, um, you will have these doubts and these trepidations when you first come to the bar. They are softened by the fact that you come with a group of people about the same age who have the similar doubts and trepidations. We all had those. Many of those people with whom I came to the bar remain my good friends now, 26 years later. Don't get me wrong, life at the bar involves long hours and hard work. It involves many sacrifices, particularly deriving from the fact that you are a sole practitioner, and as such, your income is derived only from your exertions. However, at least in my view, it has provided an intellectually and emotionally fulfilling vocation. It's the type of job where I am, gen I am genuinely happy to go to work each day. I enjoy the company of my particular chamber group members who I have chosen to be with. This is in stark contrast to solicitors partnerships where you don't personally choose who your partners are, and as a result, you may find yourself bound with persons who you don't really like. For all of these reasons, the choice of the bar for me was the right one. I'm not here to denigrate solicitors. Many of my best friends are solicitors, and they truly excel at what they do. Their role is vital. However, it ultimately involves a very different work experience than being at the bar. Turning then to the second question on the development of advocacy. If you're thinking about coming to the bar, you really must reflect on whether advocacy, both written and oral, is something you are likely to enjoy. As I said previously, in my view, you have to like the fight. That does not mean that at the stage you find yourself now, that you all have to be world-class debaters. There are many ways in which a person becomes a good, if not a great, advocate. Obviously, talent plays some role, and no doubt luck in terms of the opportunities that fortune throws up for you also plays some role. However, by far the biggest influencing factor will be acute insight and hard work. What then do I mean by these two factors? First, starting with insight. As a baby junior moving towards middle junior, you will have the opportunity to be led by seniors and also observe other juniors and senior practitioners in court. When you are young, you should regard your advocacy abilities largely as a blank canvas. 
You don't know at this early stage what ultimate depiction of your advocacy will look like. One of the great ways to become a good advocate is to observe with insight these older practitioners. You get to see what work, what works and what does not work with judges and magistrates. You get to see a wide variety of examination styles. As you develop, the insightful person will then pick up parts of those styles that they have observed and incorporate them into their own presentation style. So what do I mean by this? I use an example starting with written submissions. I can recall when I was an article clerk, I briefed Roger Jarrington, who was then a junior, so he's now a federal court judge. I briefed him because he was my tutor in Law 101 at UQ. Roger's written submissions were structured in a way where he first identified the outcome he sought. Then he set out an exposition of the law and then an exposition of the facts. Then an application of the law to the facts leading to the ultimate conclusion in his client's favour for the relief which his client was seeking. Not only was it logically structured, but the way he set them out in the written document was both attractive and easy to read. I've followed that drafting process ever since my days as an article clerk. I had the great fortune of being junior to Pat Keane in a number of occasions. I had the opportunity to see the way that he orally presented arguments both in trials, applications and on appeal. He was intellectually first class. But in addition, he had a wonderful delivery in his oral address. This included the tempo and the rhythm of the delivery. The art of the pause at the right time so the judge could reflect on the importance of a proposition that he had just made. And the delivery of a witticism which would amuse the judge and often appropriately in applied and self-deprecating way belittle the other side's argument. In the area of cross-examination, there are a myriad of different styles. When I was at university, and I, I know this is gonna sound pathetic, but we used to go in the holidays and watch serious criminal trials in the Supreme Court. This was my first introduction to the art of cross-examination. Generally, for instance, in a murder trial, you would be seeing the top barristers at the height of their powers displaying their art. Again, when you start out, you're not going to have a developed style. To some extent, you'll be flailing around, but by insightful observation, the more senior and better of the more senior and better practitioners, you'll learn the different styles. When I say you'll be flailing around, that's in no way meant to be an insult, because I can still recall when I first appeared in the magistrate's court, flailing around, trying to develop a style of cross-examination. What you will come to understand is that the examination of witnesses you may move between various styles depending on how the particular cross-examination proceeds. A further aspect <coughs> which is necessarily intertwined with insightfulness is simply hard work. You can have all the talent in the world, but if you're not prepared to work hard, you will not be a good advocate. Ultimately, the heart of the hard work in my view lies in the discipline of establishing a case theory well before trial. A well-defined case theory allows you to focus your preparation for your advocacy, both in terms of cross-examination and delivery of written and oral submissions. Now, things will change during the trial and necessarily your case theory will have to be molded to how the facts emerge during the proceeding. Nonetheless, it is that discipline of the development of the case theory and preparation for your advocacy consistent with the case theory that will see you provide your client with the best opportunity of success. Again, thank you for letting me speak this evening, ladies and gentlemen, and hopefully I'll be able to give you some insightful answers to your questions um, in the following session. Can I assure you that I don't mind what the question is? Um, for years I taught in the bar course, I think 15 years, I taught the civil procedure, drafting affidavits and so forth, and I'd often have the young readers come to me for questions before they actually started. So please give me whatever you've got and I'll do my best to answer it. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, it was amazing to hear about your career um, and I guess your view of the bar and advocacy. Um, 
Before we move on to the substantive content tonight, um, I'll firstly introduce the rest of our panel. Um, so firstly, um, we have Keith Wiley. Um, Keith specialises in land use proceedings in the Planning and Environment Court, Land Court and Magistrates Court, including merit appeals, de declaratory, 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 I can't speak tonight, I'm <laughs> sorry ladies and gentlemen, and enforcement proceedings, compensation, valuation and mining proceedings and regulatory offence prosecutions, as well as appeals to higher courts against those decisions. Keith regularly acts for private clients as well as local authorities and the state. He has been consistently ranked as a leading junior in Doyle's Guide for the Queensland Planning and Environment Practice Area. Prior to being called to the bar, Keith completed a Bachelor of Laws with First Class Honours um, through the University of Technology, was appointed as an associate to his honour, Judge Rackman, and was then employed as an in-house solicitor with the Brisbane City Council, dealing predominantly in planning appeals. Since being called to the bar, Keith has completed a Master of Laws um, through the University of Queensland, but we won't hold that against him. <laughs> Prior to entering the law, Keith was an army officer and a Black Hawk helicopter pilot. How cool is that? Um, before uh, being deployed overseas on operations and achieving the rank of major. He's a graduate of the Australian Defence Academy and completed aeronautical engineering and Masters of Management Studies degrees through the University of New South Wales finishing first in his class in both degrees. Joining him, we have Georgia Kiss. Georgia was called to the bar in 2021, so she is brand new, and I'm hoping that we'll have some amazing insight from her. She received a Bachelor of Laws with Honours from the Queensland University of Technology in 2017, and a Master of Laws with Distinction from Queen's University, Belfast in 2019. <coughs> Georgia was an associate to her honour, Fleur Kingham, who is president of the Land Court um, throughout 20, sorry, 2017 and 2018, and was admitted in 2017. Our fourth panelist tonight is Kurt McDonald. Um, if you came to last year's panel, you will recognise Kurt because he has so kindly come back this year. Um, Kurt's first experience in the legal industry was working as a settlement clerk in property law. He also undertook some work experience with a barrister through the QUT mentor program and also reached out to some sole practitioners in Mount Gravatt and Brackenridge. Importantly, Kurt undertook some volunteering with Law Right as an advocate in the Mental Health Review Tribunal. From 2020 to 2021, Kurt was the associate to his honour Judge Allen QC in the District Court. In February 2021, he joined Fuller and White Associate, sorry, Fuller and White Solicitors as a solicitor advocate in criminal defence law. Please make all of our panelists feel very welcome. Tonight. Um, so, my first question, I guess, is for the entire panel, um, and any of you can kick off. Um, but essentially, I want to know what, where was this seed? Where, where did you get your interest in advocacy? Where did that come from for each of you? Oh, I'll start. Um, <laughs> so I used to be in the Army, and uh, I was studying a law degree uh, through QT by correspondence or you know, distance learning. And uh, people got a, a, a reputation, people heard that I was studying law, so whenever anybody got charged, I was often asked to be a defending officer or to be the prosecuting officer. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever seen on television like court martials or in the military, they have their own disciplinary system, and it's a bit of a kangaroo court, but it followed roughly the same rules. You have a defending officer and a prosecuting officer, and you have to cross-examine witnesses and the like, and I really, I really enjoyed it. And, um, and through a bit of work, I got some people off, because ordinarily in the army, it's understood that if you're charged, you have to plead guilty, no matter what, because that's just what you do. And um, I had a couple of soldiers that w weren't guilty, so I sort of persuaded them to, to plead not guilty and, um, and got them off. And oftentimes at the end, the commanding officer who was the judge would sort of give me a reprimand for, for defending them. But anyway, that's why <laughs> I, got a, I got a real taste for it. And so I decided that um, I wanted to go to the bar, I wanted to do the job. And so, yeah, that, that was the seed. And then, so what I did is, and I'd recommend it, anybody that's interested in advocacy is to be a judge's associate. And I thought, I'll do the judge's associate. And then I had the, the luck or the privilege to go, as Tom said, watch barristers barrister or do whatever they do. 
and, uh, and from watching that, I thought this is where I want to be. So that's that was my journey. Um, mine isn't nearly as, as interesting as Pete's. Um, I my seed, I guess, started to grow when I was an associate just being in court every day for my judge and um, being lucky enough to witness some incredible advocacy. Um, and so I think that really sparked my interest initially. And I, um, I always liked performing, um, like in theatre or debating at school, and I just thought that this might be something that I'd be interested in. So that's where that's sort of came from. Oh, yeah, I sort of, was in two folds. Um, my dad was a baker and when I turned five to start school he brought me into work a few night shifts so I knew I didn't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then I used to like argue with my teachers in school so they said I should be a lawyer so here we are. Well I debated and did oratory at school and uh, anybody from Indra Philly here or around Indra Philly? Yeah, well, I used to work in the drive-through in the Indrapilly pub, and I flipped a coin for medicine or law. And it <laughs> that's how I got to do it. Amazing, amazing. Imagine having that choice, medicine or law. Which <laughs> one? Um, incredible. Okay, so um, we might sort of talk about all of your time as associates, because you all were associates. Um, firstly, what is a judge's associate in, in your words? What, what is it? What, does it, what is a judge's associate? What do they do? What are their duties? Well, I might be able to start. So the associate's really the judge's personal choice for an assistant. And they, their role can vary from judge to judge. So some judges will have them doing research, um, helping to you know do initial drafts of ideas for judgments and things like that. Other judges, it's more you know, you help them out in court and things things on that side. So my judge never got me to do research, so probably didn't trust me, but um, <laughs> it was a wonderful experience. He was a great man. I'm still very, very good friends with him now. Um, it was a fantastic year. In those days, you made more money from being an associate than from being an article clerk. So it was, a, from a fiscal side, it was really good. Um, and, you know, you got to meet all the other judges. So if you're going to the bar, you did have that benefit that they knew you from your time as an associate. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, anyone else? Yeah. I think that basically sums it up. I think there's um, multiple um, parts of an associateship. So you're in court, in the land court, which is where I was, there aren't bailiffs. So you play a large role in running the judge's courtroom. That's in the land court is different from the district courts. Um, and really, you you act as as Tom said as a researcher for your judge, but you're also there um, to basically do anything for your judge at any time of the day or night or weekend. But it doesn't. It sounds um, not like it is. It's it's such a privilege, I guess, to work in such um, close proximity with with a judge and to be able to then have ongoing um, a mentoring relationship with them, with them afterwards. So I can't recommend it highly enough. Could I tell one amusing story? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, my judge let me out to another judge one day, uh, John Byrne, and uh, he was the most fearsome judge <laughs> in the Supreme Court. Everybody was scared of him. Uh, I certainly was. Anyhow, he took the went down the lift and uh, we walk on the corridor at the back of the courts and he said, he said, I'll look in to see whether they're ready. So I looked in and there were t two barristers and there were two solicitors. And I said, oh yeah, they're ready, ready judge. And we go in, there's no bail and for some reason. And he says, well, you open the court. So I open the full stand, court rise, you know, for the honorable. Anyhow, these people, they went purple in the face. And I thought immediately something's wrong here. I take him into the wrong courtroom. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I thought, okay, I'm dead. And he thought it was hilarious because he just scared these poor people to death. He said he wouldn't like that. Maybe so. <laughs> the two things about being an associate that I thought were good is the first is it was actually 
um, watching the mechanics of a trial. So feeling a, a level of comfort even being in a courtroom. So for instance, knowing that little things like, you know, outside of court you call them judge, inside uh, court you call them your honour. Knowing that you've always got to stand up when you're speaking and you never have two people standing up at the same time. The order that you stand at the bar table, so at the bar table that's the senior on the right all the way to the junior. And then also as an associate you do some cool jobs like when you have a criminal trial you have to have a jury. So you have this thing, it's like Chuck Lotto, and it's this big barrel and you put all the potential jurors' names in it and you turn it around and you sort of you pull them out by random. And so that was pretty interesting and taking verdicts from the jury. So that in court stuff was interesting. You had to deal with, your job was to deal with all the exhibits, don't lose them, those sorts of things. And then outside of court, you've got two lawyers. So, you know, as, as hopefully you know, lawyer is anyone that practices in the law and you've got sub lawyers, you've got judges, barristers, solicitors and jurists, which are academics. So you've got two lawyers at the extreme end of their professional career. The person, the lawyer that's just finished their law degree and the lawyer that's at the top of their game. And so having that um, bouncing off one another, if it's a good relationship, it's good for both because the associate gives the judge a bit of energy and a bit of enthusiasm from somebody else that's been there forever. And then, you know, they flick off these, these pearls of wisdom, you know. So from advocacy, you know, judges like to talk because being a judge, there's very little feedback inside the court. And so you'll come back into chambers and you'll go, oh, was that all about judge? Oh, yeah, he did a really good job on that. Did you notice this? You know, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, you watching closing breaths, that'll come back. And so it was really good just to, to get essentially, not only do you watch the best advocates do their work, as, as Tom described, but you get a... A running commentary from the judge on it too, so yeah, that was good. Yeah, maybe the only thing to add to that, adding what Keith said, is you when you become an associate, you also get appointed as a deputy sheriff, um, which gives you the powers to arraign and um, administer the allocutus, which is just when you stand up and go, "How do you plead guilty or not guilty?" and sort of shouting it out and proclaiming it once it's done. And you know, you get to stare down over your glasses and sort of <laughs> give them the you know, the talking to that you never would have otherwise got to. So yeah, all those sort of random ceremonial roles you don't really expect, you sort of sit and do. And that actually brings me um, on to something that I'm quite interested about is in terms of I guess you obviously go in knowing nothing necessarily about it. An associateship and what you're going to do. But if you get the role, like what does the onboarding or training process look like? Because um, yeah, as you as you said, Kurt, there are some weird sort of ceremonial things that you've got to do. How do you learn that? You have no idea what to do beforehand. Is it sort of deep end or? Yeah, well, you get given three days training usually at the start, um, and that's quite um, thorough. And they give you an associate's menu that's started off in 1860 and gets added to every year. Um, so you read that. But it, it, if you're unlucky, the very first time you go to court is on circuit. Mm -hmm. So someone might start on the Monday and then by the Thursday they're in the Roma District Court um, running a jury trial and they've never done anything like that before and they've got no one else to talk to about it. So it's a real trial by fire. And then that person, there's usually one judge that will do a 10 week circuit around all the regions right at the start of the year. So the first 10 weeks they're just living out of the car, travelling to all these regional courts and have to learn pretty quickly, otherwise... Um, yeah. Definitely chucked at the deep end, yeah. by the sounds of it, yeah. Is that the same experience across the board? Yeah, so I didn't have any training. Yeah. It, to be clear, so, <laughs> and I'll be candid, it's not a challenging job. Like, it's, you, you're not the one writing the judgment, and you're not the one ruling on objections. So, But yeah. it is embarrassing if you can't find the document that you need to yeah. write in court that the judge has asked you to find in front of all the other until barristers you, again. Yeah, yeah. And, until you get to the point about halfway, look, in my experience, about halfway through, the judge started to get me to research points of law or draft little bits of judgments or scroll through the evidence to try and find any evidence on this point. But in court, it's an administrative role. The, the benefit is, is really that relationship you get with the judge. As Tom said, the relationship you get with all the other judges. 
so that whether as a solicitor or a barrister, you appear before those judges, they know you. And so I'll appear before the judge and I'd go, you know, you have to announce your appearance at the end of the, you know, the, at the commencement of each hearing. And, you know, the judge will say, oh, Mr. Wiley, could you please announce your appearance? And, you know, oh, my name's Wiley, I'll appear you, you know. <laughs> so that, that's getting to know everybody is, is, is important. It, it can be a bit frightening when you are thrown in the deep end. I went straight into a 13 and a half week trial where Sir Leslie Tease was suing for defamation, uh, Channel 9, for alleging that he'd bribed Joe Bjorka Peterson with supplying him D9 bulldozers. And so you had Ian Callan who went on to the High Court for um, one side, and then you had Heinrich Nichols, who became Sir Heinrich Nichols, on the other side, who was his flamboyant New South Wales defamation lawyer. And then I'd never worked in a court in my life. <laughs> and uh, I can remember Sir Heinrich Nichols when I complained that somebody had been going through the exhibits called me an impertinent young man. And I've <laughs> never forgotten it. But, uh, so it was quite, quite frightening. And at the end, there were something like 89 separate imputations. And we, have a, we had a four-person civil jury. And I had to read the verdict for every one of the 80 or so and so it was, so say your foreman, so say you all. I had to ask them for every single one of the 81s. And by the end of it, it was, so slay your swarman, so <laughs> slay your It was just, uh, it was quite frightening. But, um, and I had to get it all right. So there are, <laughs> there are tricky bits. Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think anyone here can sort of say that they don't expect there to be tricky bits. But yeah, that's got to be, that's, that's be pretty rough straight into 13 weeks, definitely. Mm. Um, okay, so in terms of, I guess, um, we did mention circuits earlier. So how does, I guess, going on circuit generally work? Um, so you, you have to eat dinner with your judge every night. That's one of your really important roles. <laughs> the judge wants somebody to eat dinner with and usually have a drink with. And so that, um, it, it's, I didn't find it great. I don't know that anybody else. <laughs> no, I loved it. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I had a small child at home, so oh, I could, oh, you know. I, could, you know. <laughs> I mean, I like I like the judge. I've got a really well with him, but just being out of home for weeks yeah. in a hotel room. Um, what did you do? Yeah, I, I went to Maroochydore for my circuit from now on. So it wasn't too bad going to Maroochydore, being put up by the government, looking over the water for a few weeks. <laughs> We were supposed to go to Mount Isa, but that was at the peak of um, COVID. So we, the only way we could get there was by a 20 hour train. Um, so we ended up just conducting it from Brisbane, and, um, having the defence barrister sitting in the Mount Isa courthouse with all the defendants and the Crown prosecutor was sitting in the empty court with us. So. I, I will say this, <laughs> an important thing for the Bar Association is the regional practitioners. So there is, an independent bar in Rocky, um, small one in Mackay, uh, but in Townsville and Bundaberg, they're quite important locations. Several of those have their own Supreme Court judge and most of those have district court judges and certainly magistrates. So whilst you, know, you will go on circuit, there are separate bars up there. You get to meet the practitioners from up there. My general experience is that they're great. They always love it when you come to town. Um, I can remember Judge Jutney, who was the Supreme Court judge in Rockhampton, you'd do a matter and then he'd say, call you into chambers afterwards. He'd sit you down and he'd say, now what's the gossip from Brisbane? <laughs> <laughs> and then you'd have to tell the gossip. So, um... One thing that's good about circuiting, we went to Bundy a couple of times, and I think this is a really good thing for the administration of justice. Because in trials, you just want to find Everyone's busy, you just want to find the heart of the problem, get to the heart of the problem and, and run that. And so for a judge, a judge relies very much upon the honesty of the solicitors and barristers appearing before them because you know that, that they know the matter intimately, so there's there's got to be trust. Because if the solicitor or barrister misleads the judge, you know, their their career's over. When we went on circuit, we'd always have ordinarily it's all for crime, and so it's it's you know, on the one side you've got the Crown Prosecutor, you've normally got three or four or five trials back to back. Um, and then you've got the Crown Prosecutor who just does them all back to back and then you'll have a public defender paid for by legal aid who do them back to back to back. 
And what we'd often do two times a week is me, the judge, and the two barristers would go out for dinner. And so it was really good just to sort of humanise on a level. And what that did is that diffused the tension between the opposing counsel. And then what it also meant was that there was a, a, a level of affection uh, with the judge and it made the trial so much better. And then I was in another matter which was a really complex arbitration between John Holland and Adani over construction on the Abbott Point coal loading terminal. And the judge, or the arbitrator, but the judge at the very, at, at, you know, every two or three weeks would have a dinner and he'd have all the barristers and all the partners and he attend dinner and you know have dinner and have a couple of wines and just talk about anything but the trial, and that sort of really made the, the it took the heat out of the trial very effectively. You anyway, know, so that was my that was an experience in circuit that because everyone's so busy and everyone's got families and kids and stuff, you know, that doesn't happen in Brisbane. So that's unique to circuit. I think my memory of circuit is just having to be acutely organised um, because. I'm not sure if it's the same now, but we had to take all of our files with us if we were um, mediating or if we were in court um, on our trip up. We would normally sort of go to Townsville and Mackay and make it quite a large circuit, so we would be away for a couple of weeks. And that organisation included trying to make things as easy as possible for your judge, so making sure they know what gate to go to at the airport, that they have their ticket. Um, picking up the hire car, driving the hire car, which is also petrifying, driving the judge around. Um, and as Tom said, then trying to make sure that everything was okay for them after court. So um, working out where the best place is to go to dinner. And then, um, I mean, it makes it sound arduous. It wasn't at all. I, I loved it, but I just remember always coming home from circuit, being absolutely exhausted and, um, the lead up, just having to make sure that I had a list and that I stuck to the list every time to make sure that I'm not in town for and I forgot my file. Um, but yes, yeah, I, I also loved it. It was a really great bonding experience between you and your judge as well. So, yeah. So obviously we've covered the organisational um, and I guess administrative aspect of being a judge's associate, but what else is it that judges look for um, when you're applying um, and how can students best prepare for that application process? I think um, you want to make a good impression when you're interviewed by the judge. Uh, that means you have to vocalise, you know, be friendly, speak up. Um, they'll ask you questions. so. Be ready to sort of meaningfully ask, answer questions that you get asked. Um, <clears throat> they'll they'll be looking for somebody that they like, that they can get on with. And now, some judges look for marks only. Um, so I've I've seen some judges on the website say only first class honours. Not all judges are like that. So don't think that if you haven't got first class honours, you can't get an associateship. So I do think first impressions will matter with judges because they've got to work with you on a daily basis. You're the first person they see when they come in, you're the last person they see when they leave, and you're working with them in court. So getting on with the judge and then feeling that you're somebody they can get on with will be really important. I think also a good tip is in your letter to put something quirky about you without an interest or something that um, or, or, a, or a hobby. I mean, I was in a, a, um, a gym group in the Northern Territory for a year after I finished high school, and my judge told me that that was basically hands down the thing that she chose my application on. Um, and there were applicants who had first class honours um, who I was up against, and I didn't get first class honours. I got um, second class. So, um, I think that was really important and I'm so glad that I put that I was a Gilgrew um, into my letter. So think about something that defines you and um, is unique to you and, and try to bring that into your, into your application. Yeah, the advice I'd be, I'll, yeah, I'll be careful with my friends is with your CV, 
Because when I was an associate, one of, one of your jobs is to find the next associate. And so your judge would go, right, show me the 20 or 30 best, best reports. So many CVs, they just made the author out to be a wanker. You know, just these things that just say, look, you know, oh, you know, and I, I, I saved sight worldwide and then I cured cancer and, you know, and then I adopted a kid overseas and you just think, give me strength. So, uh, whilst don't, don't be afraid to pump your own tyres, but just a bit of humility in the CV because you're giving your CV to, if it's particularly if it's a Supreme Court judge, or someone like Tom, you're a Tom CV, you know, far out. You know, if you're going to tell him that you were president of your model train association, it's the highlight of your life. You're giving your CV to somebody that's that's a great person. So just take it easy on the CV. You know, if, if it's a ten, bring it to about a seven or an eight. So never never misrepresent on your CV. Oh yeah. So that's really important. Never misrepresent because if you do and you found out, then that's your son. And it won't be just with that judge. That judge will tell the other. They all. One thing you do see as judge associate is they all talk with each other all the time. So a barrister does something wrong in court within an hour after being outside of court, virtually every Supreme Court judge will know what that barrister did. So um, just make sure you're accurate in what you're saying. Um, really important. Probably doesn't need to be said, maybe it does. Uh, don't put your photograph of your head on a CV. Um, that's something that it, judges are very, most of them are old fashioned, so that's a bit odd. Um, and something that Georgia touched on, which is absolutely right, is the, the, the court's website says, oh, I just lodge your application with this portal. Do that, but 80% of judges don't pick up from that. And so what you need to do is you need to stalk a dozen judges that you think for, for whatever reason there's at least some sort of nexus or connection write them a covering letter no more than a page or a page and a little bit attaching a two-page cv that just says something that says look here's here's something that i'm not don't not being this obvious but the intent of the letter is to say hey here's something that you and i have in common so for instance i found a whole bunch of judges that had been that were in the in the university were cadets at university or or had been in the reserves for some time or the like. And that got me the interviews, and that, that ultimately got me over the line. And, and it wasn't my marks, but it was the fact that you're a little bit different because the judge isn't looking for an associate, you know, this first class, honestly, 100%. Yeah, the judge isn't looking for somebody to take over their job and draft their judgments. The judge is looking for somebody that they can, because being a judge is an extraordinarily lonely job. And so they want somebody that they can spend eight to 12 hours a day with and, you know, and, and be happy. And so that, the, the advice I'd give is a short CV that doesn't make you sound like a wanker. Identify your judges and, and try and form a nexus with the judge and a covering letter to the judge, um, you know, getting it out there. Get it proofread by someone else. If you've got a typo, it's over and um, early. So judges are so, so just say that you want to be, a, you know, I would be writing letters, it's probably too late for next year. I'd be writing letters now for the year after. And if you think, shit, I've left my run too late, I'd, be, I'd still do that and then go get a job. If this is your final year, I'd still write applications for the year after spend a year at a firm or a year doing something and then if you say because everyone all the the lawyers rate judges and rate judges associates if you went to a firm and said look i'm gonna have to take a, a year sabbatical to go be an associate and i'll come back they'll 100 percent they'll do it so be early because if you started applying for, for an associateship next year it's too late and one other thing i was just thinking following on what keith said is being really clever with um, with your hobbies and your interests and don't just put, because normally they come at the end of a CV and you just want to rattle them off and get it done and people will say, oh, like, um, reading. Or, I mean, that is genuine. If you love reading, put it in and have books that you want to, that you can recall off the top of your head or authors to discuss with your judge. Um, for instance, the, the associate before me in his cover letter wrote about, uh, in his CV had that he had chickens. 
and that was one thing that my judge saw and thought, I've got chickens too, I'm going to interview this guy. <laughs> and they got on and they spoke about their chickens for most of the interview and he got the, he got the position. So just be really clever and, um, and yeah, quirky with, with your hobbies and the way that you write your letter. Yeah, just briefly on that, you can, as long as they don't take it down during, which some of them do when you're writing the applications, they're swearing in speech is sort of like an autobiography that's on their judicial profile. So you can get a certain, you can read that and get a flavour of the judge about what they're about and what they've done and what they do. And if that sort of aligns with your own values and what you do. Um, so this is probably my last sort of question about, I guess, judges associates. Uh, um, but in terms of your time um, as a JA, what was, I guess, the most interesting thing you saw or what's the best thing that you took away from your time? I suppose, um, I mean, there were so many interesting things. I mean, there really was. It was because you got the whole array of the law. You got criminal and you got civil and all different types of civil. Now, it, sometimes if you're lucky, your judge might be in the you know, the mental health tribunal. So if you're interested in medical things, then you get exposed to that medical side of the law as well. So it depends what your judge does. Um, I suppose the relationship with the judge afterwards, I mean, I, I, I say I'm lucky. I think every associate thinks they're lucky because they all, you generally do like your judge. Um, my judge was a great person and he was, he was just a kind man and you know, I was fresh out of university and green, green as green could be. And, um, and you know, if I made a mistake, he never, never yelled at me or criticised me. And the reality is when you go into practice and you first start out, you will make mistakes. That, that's life. Nobody's um, bulletproof. You're learning on the job. And it was just sort of his kindness and his friendship was the thing that I took from it. The two things I'll touch on is firstly um, watching a judgment start, you know, watching a, a, a 10, 20, 100 page judgment, which, you know, when I was um, like you studying undergrad, you know, you, you read the odd judgment here or there. Um, watching that start from a blank sheet of paper and, and working it up and, you know, assisting and, 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 and you know, more the polishing than the drafting, but, you know, just watching a judgment form and watching the judge during the judgment writing process, because after the trial finishes, judgments take anywhere between one to nine months to be delivered, roughly. And so watching the judge's position change as you reread the evidence, reread the submissions, and just watching the judgment flow and, and become a final, you know, set in stone until you, you know, your job as the associate, you'd sort of ring up, you'd email the parties and say, you know, dear parties, uh, his honor will be handing our judgment at 9 a.m. tomorrow and then you watch all the parties come in and you know, they're all doing this. And so, and, and similar to that, uh, and so that was sort of one thing that was really good. The other one was, and I'll, and you know, crime's not my cup of tea, and I, you know, that, that's other people practicing that, that's trivial, not for me, but 
being in criminal trials was something that I'm a civil lawyer and I was always going to be a civil lawyer. Um, but I'm glad that I observed some, you know, watching the jury deliberate, seeing the verdict returned, seeing, you know, the heartache of a, you know, a, you know, for instance, a, a rape trial where the defendants are acquitted, but you know, you know from evidence that wasn't admitted that that was not permitted to be admitted, that they were probably good for it, you know. So watching the 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 true emotion of a criminal trial is something that. Um, is really important, and, and and there's still that aura uh, associated with criminal trials. You know, you get these criminals that, you know, they're hardened criminals, they're bad people, and you bring them in, and then you've got the judges wearing a red 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 jacket, looking like Santa Claus, and then you've got the barristers with their wigs, looking like Harry Potter, and yeah, you know, all these twelve jurors taking everything down, and even then they think, right, this is important. You know, this is an important situation. And, Watching the jury, you know, take their time, and they're always so good. So yeah, seeing that side of it, you get a thrill of your life. But <laughs> yeah. well, I, um, I guess going in, you know, at uni, I, I didn't do. Anything. I was the greatest student. Um, the first moot I did here, I lost ex parte. <laughs> um, so going in, I, loved, I had a lot of high hopes, and, and what I learned from a year is basically. Well, now I've been in practice for about a year and a half now in criminal law. Um, and for probably the first six months to a year, I was just parroting what I'd seen before. So you see all the great barristers say the things they say, and if you say it as well, then you're going all right. Um, Any time they'd said something in particular, I'd write a note down and, and try and save it up for later. Um, you know, speaking of, speaking of Keith, I saw Keith when I was filling in for a judge, and. Um, you know, took down some of his notes about his P and E thoughts, um, and when um, when you see him there, and they go, oh, you know, Keith's here appearing today, so we'll, you know, we'll know what the matter's about quite quickly after what Keith says. So, you know, you're, you're, you're extra careful in your listening to make sure you don't miss some sort of pearl of wisdom. Um, the other, I don't know, the question was about a funny thing. There was only one thing that was quite funny that. Um, when I was up in Maroochydore on the circuit, there was a fellow that had smuggled a bunch of squirrels back in his underwear um, and put it on Instagram Live. <laughs> he, he Instagram Live his uh, purchase of the squirrels at a Balinese um, animal market, and then he kept filming it as a poll and saying, "Should I bring the squirrels back?" <laughs> and everyone was voting yes. <laughs> He got to the airport and he said, in the fake Gucci bag or down the pants? And everyone says, down the pants. <laughs> and then say, so somewhere over uh, Bali to, to Brisbane, some concerned citizen um, alerted the Commonwealth officials. Um, and on touching down in Australia, immigration were immediately in his face going, mate, where are the bloody squirrels? <laughs> so, he managed to get one out of his out of his pants pocket, and they saw one run across the <laughs> the floor. And then they said, "Well, where's the other one? We know there's one more." So they took him out the back and found it. Um, and the Crown Prosecutor was a CDPP fellow. He, he sort of put this really emotional spin on it. At the end of his submissions, he said, "Now, Your Honour." these squirrels had to be given the death penalty. So, Your Honour should take that into account and in the sentence that these squirrels died. <laughs> this man killed what otherwise would have been a very happy life. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was... That was <laughs> yeah, I think that story might take the cake. Um, if I'm perfectly honest. But, um, Kurt, are there any plans for you to go to the bar um, for more squirrel shenanigans? Perhaps. If my employers are watching this, then absolutely not. <coughs> um, but otherwise, yeah, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. Hopefully to go on a, a criminal bar profession, because I'm not cut out for the civil stuff. <laughs> um, well, I'm hoping to get the, the rough and tumble of, of crime um, sometime soon, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, so... Um, in terms of, I guess, the process of going to the bar, it's quite, I guess, expensive for one. Um, and two, it, it can be quite time consuming. Georgie, you're probably the best person to 
to speak to this, having done this so recently, but what was that process like? Um, arduous. <laughs> the exams, there's three exams, and they say you should study for three months or a month for each exam, and so that's what I did. And I recommend that because um, that will ensure that you'll get through if you, if you take your three months and read something every day and study on the weekends. So that's the first thing is um, don't underestimate the exams that you've got to put it through. Um, so the exam is <coughs> the first hurdle. And you then have your um, six week intensive bar course, which is just amazing. You meet the cohort of barristers who have either sat the exam that you sat or um, deferred their course and had sat an earlier exam. They become your mates for life. Um, you bond together throughout the six weeks and you really feel as if you're in the trenches because they hit you hard with um, moots and with written work that is really, they, they try to um, replicate what a busy six weeks would be at the bar for probably Tom and Keith um, with sort of late nights, think multiple things due on the same day, um, having to prepare cross-examination, you know, late at night after having to submit advices and written work the same day and after having been at court having lectures from eight till four. So um, the course is great. It's very, very hard and time consuming, but it's well worth it because I felt extremely prepared um, in my leadership year, which I'm just about to finish. It is expensive. You have to think about finding chambers, whether you'll squat with another barrister. So squatting is where you sit in um, another barrister's room with a desk and just work in their chambers with them. Um, a lot of barristers do that initially for the first few months before they're able to find a reader's room or have enough money to pay the rent. Um, so there is the cost um, associated. You have to have money saved because once you eventually get to the bar, um, you may not be paid for like three months and um, it can get a little bit tight in the first six months, but it's definitely worth it. And Georgia, was that, um, was that process different during COVID? Because mm -hmm. you would have been right during the pandemic. How yes. did that go for you? Um, so my exam was pushed back. I was meant to do it in 2020 and I ended up doing it uh, I think I was meant to do it in February and I ended up doing it in October, so that was the first delay, which was fine, given what other people were going through, it, didn't, it wasn't an issue um, to me. And during the six week course, there were a few snap lockdowns and the association handled it beautifully. We just moved seamlessly onto online lectures and moots. And I think that that was actually quite good because you weren't having a cross-examine cross or um, do your evidence in chief like via a video link, which is what's happening more and more now, or it was during the pandemic. So mm -hmm. that was actually actually great. It was like they had planned it. Um, so yeah, that's awesome. And did anyone else have any insight into I guess what the process is like, or is that so far, you know, in the past? What was that the it's process kind of, of <coughs> um, the process of going to the bar. Okay. Yeah. Well, it was black and white back then, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. <laughs> I suppose I was there when we first brought in um, the exams and I wasn't a believer at the time in them, but I, I wrote and marked for 10 years every civil procedure, so one of the things. So Damien is the vice president, he did, I think he did ethics, and then Rowan Jackson, who's now a district court judge on the coast, he did evidence. And so Rowan, I get on really well with both of them, but we'd often, compare how people had done on our particular exams just to see whether, you know, you get the feeling about whether we're getting it right with the marking and so forth. Mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer in it now. Um, the exams have, you know, have set a standard for coming to the bar, um, which I think is appropriate. Um, you do have to be proficient in civil procedure, proficient in evidence, and you have to have a very good understanding of your ethics to come to the bar. Because particularly with the ethics, you're at the coalface in the courtroom. Um, you're the one who's going to have to make the difficult calls as things change in the trial. Um, you've got to get it right. So the ethical things are things you have to get right. Um, I will say this, 
the bar is a great place for being able to get advice from other people. So you usually in a set of chambers. So I squatted when I first went to the bar in a library um, up on level 16 at Key Central. And um, it was great. Kylie Downs squatted with me. We were both the same library. She's now a federal court judge. Um, so uh, that was fine. Six months, I could start getting a bit of cash flow. I'd save some money up, you know, from working at the bottle shop and also as a solicitor for the time. So I had, I think it's always good to try and get, save some money so you've got um, a bulk there. So I never had to go into an overdraft. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it is about six months to get your cash flow going. And you'll find some solicitors are absolutely shocking paying you. So you might do a matter and it might be six months before they pay you and sometimes even longer. Um, so, no, I think it's a great process. The bar, I think the bar courses worked really well. It was a very tough decision for us to cancel one of the bar courses when COVID first hit. Um, uh, but we were able to run every single one after that, including the one which you're on, um, where we able to move seamlessly to sort of um, online and video, which was great. Yeah, my like yeah. I think you need about a, yeah. You need to have some money aside, but I think my experience was you get a three month buffer. If you could pay your rent and you know pay for yourself and pay for your fuel and keep your way for three months, um, that's you know, that, that that was where I was at. Um, when you come to the bar, everybody's very kind to you because they know that if you progress at the bar, you know you'll do well. So for instance. All your legal subscriptions, so your Lexus Nexus and your Westlaw subscriptions, they have these bar, they have these reader rates that for the first year or two you pay an ashtray money for those, whereas now you're paying thousands of dollars in a year. Um, and the, the most important thing really going to the bar is is finding a good, I reckon a good junior barrister rather than a silk to, to really take you under their wing. Because when you start at the bar, the starting point is you very rarely get briefed by your old firm because they'll look at you and say, well, look, you were just like me for two months ago. Why should I give, you know, because the barrister's the decision maker at the trial. Well, you know, why should I give you this brief? You know, you're no better than me. So you, you'll start off being briefed by strangers. So I was a solicitor for only six months. And then I'd be in a conference with this other solicitor who briefed me, who's been a solicitor for 30 years, and I go, well, I think we're going that way. And the solicitor goes, oh, the barrister says we're going that way, we're going that way. So you're not gonna get briefed by your old firm, so where do you get your work from? Unless, you, know, you, you get your work from your junior barristers who you become friendly with and look after, and then they give you what's called flicks and devils. So a devil is where a barrister gets an opinion, a right to write an advice or an opinion or settle a pleading or something like that. They say, right, mate, you do it, you do the first cut, and then um, charge me your hourly rate, and then I'll, I'll, I'll tart it up and we'll send it out under my name. And so you get paid from the, the senior barrister. Um, and a flick is where a barrister gets a brief that's pretty straightforward, and the barrister says to the solicitor, look, this is, I'm a bit busy at the moment, and really, you don't need me for something this straightforward. I've got Georgia in chambers, she's terrific. Um, why don't you flick it to her, um, and, and I'll keep an eye on her, and, and she'll do it. And the sister goes, oh, all right, no worries. And then Georgia does a terrific job, of course she's going to do. And then what happens then, the solicitor says, all right, if I've got a really complex job, I keep going to Keith, um, but if I've got a straightforward job, I'll go to Georgia at half the fee. And so that's sort of, and then, Amongst solicitors, solicitors are constantly looking for junior counsel that are responsive and, and do a good job. And then that solicitor will say to the other solicitor, geez, I used Georgia Kiss the other day, you know, just on a stat demand, and geez, she was good. And then that's how it all starts. Yeah. I think also, sorry, Tom, yeah. with the deviling, it's a really good way to get paid in your first three months because generally, um, if I was doing the devil for Keith, he would pay me as soon as I, as it's in his inbox. Yeah, the day. The same day, because these barristers know what it's like to be a baby barrister and be scrambling for money each month to pay your chamber fees. So, um, devils are fabulous as a baby and as, as a reader, because generally, the other thing is with the devils, the, the senior barristers who you're deviling for will generally give you a call and say, 
this is where you're going to watch how you did that. Um, there's something that you could have done a little bit better here. I'm going to send you back the, the um, document that I settled and sent off and have a look and give you a call if you've got any questions. And that is just amazing. And um, we also foster relationships. And after can call Keith and say, I've got a really tricky question, can I ask you? And, and nine times out of 10, they'll say, yes, like fire away, or they'll say, can't talk to you right now, call me back tomorrow or come and get a coffee. And um, it's extremely collegiate. Everybody says that, but it's not until you're actually in the position that you realize how collegiate the bar actually is. It is remarkable. And um, that's one of the things I absolutely love about being a barrister. So uh, I will say, don't think it's a complete love in. There will be, um, <laughs> be people at the bar you don't get on with. So as in any profession, you're, you're gonna have sort of some difficult relationships. But generally, um, it's, a great, it's a great profession. And we generally get along with each other. Um, Keith's in my chambers. I'm great friends with everybody in my chambers. Um, it just, it's just worked really well. Um, and it's a nice thing to come to work and know that you get on with people. And you know you get to choose whether you want to stay in chambers or go somewhere else. And if you don't get on with somebody, it's your choice, you can go somewhere else. Um, if you're a solicitor and you're stuck in a firm with somebody who you don't like, there's not much you can do about it. Um, I will say this, a few years ago, um, you know, I've been on the council for a while, we noticed the demographic of people coming to the bar was significantly changing. And it was, it was mostly about finance that we were concerned because um, we had different rates. Baby barristers pay virtually nothing, whereas silks subsidise everybody. Um, and so we, we did a, a deep investigation into the demographics. And so on average now, the average age for somebody coming to the bar is 31. Now that obviously encompasses people still coming in their 20s but it's also reflecting that you're getting much more senior solicitors, say in their 40s coming to the bar. Whereas when I went to the bar, you know, I went, I think at 26, and that a lot of people who came to the bar in my cohort were about 26, 27. It's really quite changed um, in that respect. And what, what does that mean? I think that means people are initially practicing solicitors and maybe for more than one year. And so you're getting people doing two, three, five years as a solicitor, maybe making associate or even senior associate at firms and then coming to the bar. Um, so what they can do is it, it, it can give you that, that fiscal support that you need to get you over that first year. So when, it was a long time since I came to the bar, I think it was 94 or 95. Um, what they said was if you broke even, in the first year you're doing well. And we are speaking to Courtney about this. Um, and back in those days, breaking even was a lot less than it is now. So uh, <coughs> if you don't get a squatting position, some, you know, your outgoing can be quite significant. So if you can generate that, you're doing well. And, and generally the path with your fees, at least in the, in the uh, civil side, is goes like that so it's pretty flat at the start but by second year you start tipping up and then third fourth year it goes up a bit steeper and then once you pass that June you know baby barrister situation you're becoming a medium barrister hopefully it's tipping up into some really quite good money and then it, you know depending on how you progress it can go quite high um, but in terms of what you make as a barrister, this perception that everybody makes millions of dollars a year at the bar is an incorrect perception. There's a large section of our bar which make, make a reasonable living, but nothing like that. So it's not pots of gold um, for everybody. Uh, but, you know, it's part of it is it's a really fulfilling career. I don't do crime at all. Um, except, you know, corporate crime for things like people like Asset. Um, but I've got lots of friends who are criminal barristers and they don't make the same type of money that I make at the commercial bar, but they love what they do. They absolutely love being criminal barristers. 
Um, they're great at their job, um, but it's just, will it be the same level of remuneration? It won't be. So part of that is a result of the uh, confiscation of, you know, criminal confiscation of Proceeds Act. Now, basically, the government freezes all a criminal, uh, a purported criminal's assets. So the days of the sort of cashed up um, type of high level criminal who is going to pay you buckets of money are, is really gone in that aspect. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's what you get from the job as well. Um, and as I said, I've never regretted for a minute going to the bar. I think it's, it's been a great profession. So I, I think we, we touched on this very um, briefly, but I guess how long should you, is, is there a consensus on how long you should be a solicitor and, and before going to the bar or what's the consensus on going straight from uni, for example, if you've got the funds to do so? Look, I, I just think it's harder to go, <coughs> it is much harder now to go straight from uni than it was in the past. So in the past, in the deep past, so if you look in the 60s and 70s, they all did go straight to the bar. So those people were not solicitors, straight from university to the bar. In the 80s, the big firms, so we started expanding the big firms. So Bayes Ruthening was the biggest, then it was Morris, Butcher and Cross, became Minters. And then there were all these amalgamations. So you started getting these significant firms. They came to university and they headhunted. And so the, the brightest people for a period in the 80s went into the firms. Now, they then flowed into um, into the bar a bit later. So what, we had about a year, maybe two at the most, um, and then we went to the bar. I think, you, you know, it can be five years or six years now, uh, but if you came straight from the bar, from university, you then, you know, it's a business. So where are you gonna get your referrals from? What contacts? do you have so i regularly get young practitioners coming to see me who have come out of the bar course and i sit down with them and i say well what's your business plan you know where have you worked out that you're going in this first year that you're going to get your briefs from you know what's your budget for the first year have you arranged chambers then the people who come in and say oh i don't have a budget i haven't got chambers yet i don't know where i'm going to get my work from I mean, I don't understand how you're going to succeed at the bar if you haven't asked yourself these questions. Um, if you've got the talent and you're willing to do the hard work, I think you can succeed at the bar. Um, but if you come in, you know, just thinking that you're going to make money and you just think people are going to send you briefs, you're in for a rude shock because that won't happen. So going and being a solicitor for a year or two at least let you get contacts. Um, it also gives you an introduction to practice, which I think you know is valuable. When I was a solicitor, I really enjoyed the people I worked with in my little cell. So I had Richard Gavin was my partner and Justin McDonald was my senior associate. And they were great teachers to me. So they taught me how to draft, red pen letters, red pen pleadings. I'm not sure that goes on these days in the big firms. I think um, the supervision that used to be there is not so much there anymore. Um, but I don't know, that's my feeling is that a few years as a solicitor really helps. I contemplated going straight away and they just, when I spoke about it with other barristers and judges, they just, <coughs> going into crime, if you lacked credibility, you know, to stare someone in the eyes that's torturing somebody or beating somebody up. Um, you know, and you, and you can't hack it, then why would they brief you and there's more hardened sort of barristers out there that can do the work and have done it. Um, so that's, you know, I, I'm hoping to go in the next couple of years and by that point I would have been about four or five years as a solicitor um, versus going in straight away and possibly failing. I went in straight away. Um, so I studied here did my associateship, became admitted. Went during my university degree, I worked for some barristers. So I worked for um, a now Judge Kefford. 
and I work for um, Sandy Thompson, who is currently the SG. And they really um, encouraged me and shaped the way that I thought about um, the, the possibility of maybe becoming a barrister one day. Then I did my um, associateship and was admitted, and then I went overseas and studied in Belfast and worked in a firm part time. And there was a point there where I was applying for graduate roles, and there was either that option or the option of going straight to the bar. And I thought, bite the bullet and do it. I'm very glad I did that because it's worked out very well for me, but I've already had the contacts um, through my time, I guess, working with barristers throughout university, but also through my time in the land court, which is a very sort of niche area where I was the only associate um, because the other members at that time didn't have associates. So I was um, corresponding a lot with other barristers, not so much solicitors, but gen generally with barristers who I then called on when I um, finished the course and they were able to sort of just flip you devil, uh, give you devils or flip you work. And if you did a good job, they will re um, give you devils again or um, if it's a solicitor, they will rebrief you. So I second what Tom says with having a network and having a plan because that's incredibly important. And I had some role models and mentors that really looked up to me in my first um, 12 months, gave me devils nearly every week checked in on me, um, flipped work to me, so I was um, heavily supported. I don't know how it would have been for me if I had no support coming straight to the bar, so that's something worth talking about. So um, in, and this was also touched on very briefly, but um, in sort of readership, so um, firstly, how does, I guess, the readership here work? Um, and do you have any sort of it, does the Bar Association do any sort of official mentorship program or is that something more like you reach out to particular barristers and, and ask them to be sort of an unofficial mentor during that period? Um, so you have two mentors as part of your leadership here. So your leadership here is 12 months where you have to have um, completed lots of different things. You have to have um, two mentors, a senior and a, Q, uh, sorry, a junior and a QC and you have to meet with them every month and you have to log each meeting. You have to do um, particular CV for, for, for leaders. Um, you have to also log your court hours where you have to watch 60 hours of court over the 12 months. Um, unpaid. Unpaid. Yeah. Yeah. Unpaid and you- Your own yeah, cases you, don't your count. Your own, own cases don't count. Um, <clears throat> so, so there's they're three of the main things I can think about your leadership um, contingencies, I guess. Um, the other is that you can't accept um, direct access briefs, which is where there's no solicitor, so there's no middleman, there's the client, and there's you. Um, you can only accept those briefs if you have written permission from one of your mentors, and um, you write to the chief executive, and they grant permission for you to take the direct access brief. So that's one of the, that's I think the main contingency with your practicing certificate. Yeah, I was about to say never take a direct access brief. Yes. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. So the, ma the majority of the disciplinary matters that I deal with are people who take a direct access brief. So the rule came in because we had a particularly troubling member, which I won't name, um, who used to play the guitar at a uh, pub. And at the end of a session, the publican would say, now, Mr. X is in the corner, so anyway, with any legal problems, <laughs> go over and see him. And then, uh, so Chief Justice of the Jersey brought in this for that particular person to stop that type of thing happening. But um, to touch upon something that you said, courts is um, th there's no, uh, there was no formal, the, the Bar Association isn't a, a matchmaking or a date making service. Um, so there's no formal. Um, mentoring provided by the Bar Association. You've got to, the Bar Association has created the rules, you've got a senior and a junior master, but it's on you. And that sort of touches in upon, you know, the question as to when to go to the bar. Can you go straight away, or do you go after one year, or five years, or 10 years? I think probably the most accurate answer is you can go to the bar 
when you are friendly enough to be able to have a coffee or a beer with three barristers, two or three barristers that you think that'll look out for you, and you're gonna go into one of their chambers. Because if you've got a good relationship with a junior barrister, you'll go into their chambers, either squatting at the end of their table or in a, they have these things called readers' rooms, which is sort of like internal windowless rooms where you normally go there for 12, 24 months at very reduced rent in the chambers. And then, as long as you're not a dickhead, everyone in the group will go, oh, all right, well, you know, our job's to look out for Keith, so you'll get sort of everyone in the group giving you the odd devil or the flick or whatever. So when do you go to the bar? If, if you know, if you're good mates, if your dad's a judge or your dad's a QC or you know some mates that are, that, that are junior barristers that'll, that'll have your best interests at heart, go straight after you. Um, but if that's not the case, then that's why you go to a law firm and you stay there for the period of time that it takes, you brief out barristers and then you'll, you'll get your own little cohort going. I will say that within your chamber group, you can always go for people in your chambers. I mean, I've been a self for 13 years and I still will go to people in my group, sound out my arguments. You know, does this sound right to you? How's, you know, how does this play with you? Is that convincing? Um, uh, and as a, when you're a baby junior, that's really important to have that, that type of support. Now the Bar Association offers more formalised support in the sense of um, uh, if people want mentoring you can ask for it and we will give it. Um, apart from your two, uh, sorry I still call them masters, what's, what's, what's the new, uh, I should, what's the, the I, I still call them legal masters. Yeah that, that's right. Um, maybe mentors. Mentors. So uh, I had Pat Keane was my senior master and John Bond was my junior master. And I I went to Pat Keane about something where I had an ethical question and I was tearing me up. I was in the magistrate's court and I was, you know, and then I later confessed to John Bond that I'd been to see him. Bond gave me a complete dressing down saying, why would you bother that man with your pathetic, you know, ethic that you come and see me and I will deal with it. And, this is from John, who's got his feet up on the table wearing cowboy boots. <laughs> He's got his, picking his fingernails. <laughs> but something. but um, they were great. You know, it was, that type of thing was good. I actually went to them when I had problems. It, I, I can always rec recall that John had a, um, a Buddhist prayer wheel. So you'd be there telling him your problem and be looking off in the distance, sort of rotating the Buddhist prayer wheel <laughs> before he would give you his tones of, uh, of <laughs> advice. Um, so <clears throat> I find and have found throughout my career that that support you have in your chamber group is probably your most important because they're the people that are with you day to day. You can come to them with any problems and so forth. Um, but we've got ethics counsellors, so you've got ethics problems. There are senior barristers. You can confidentially go to them Put your scenario and they'll give you a, a ruling but it's more advice about what you should do. Um, <coughs> ethical problems are quite difficult because um, sometimes there's not a black and white answer to it. There are shades of grey uh, and you know you want to do the right thing so it's always a good thing when you've got those types of problems to ask the questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this was sort of touched on, especially considering I guess we've got a, a few civil barristers here and they've heard you obviously working um, in criminal law. Um, does practice area matter? Should you specialise? Is Are there barristers out there who do both, you know, um, commercial and criminal work or is it is it better to specialise? There, there are still um, people who you would describe as generalists, mm -hmm. which do span all disciplines. It is a much rarer thing now because, you know, it was always problematic between civil and crime because crime used to have a running list. And so if you had a criminal trial, you could never really be certain what day it was on. So you couldn't commit to doing a two week civil trial because you might have one of your criminal trials, which you've already committed to, come up sometime that two weeks. So 
there was always this sort of natural divide, which meant that the criminal people couldn't really do the civil work. Mm -hmm. um, there were exceptions, so Justice Davis was um, an exception. He started out predominantly as a criminal barrister, but he became a very successful commercial barrister as well. Um, and so he, he was able to perform both disciplines equally as well, but I, I think it is hard to do both of those. But the second thing is there is a tendency to specialise and as, as the market has grown in Queensland, so the bar is much bigger than it was 20 years ago, <clears throat> the solicitors who are specialists in the area will look for people who are specialists in their area. So in your case, I'm sure people will, will want to come to you over a vast amount of other juniors because that's your area. Um, that's what you're good at. So there is a tendency that you do specialise down. So about eight or nine years ago, we had a, um, a lady law lord come out to speak to us in bar conference. And she was lamenting the fact that in the UK, the generalists had basically disappeared. And um, in her talk, she was describing that a lot of that was the government's fault. So in the area of, even in criminal, the government had been forcing people to choose particular things in criminal over there. So you became a specialist on sentencing. That was you. You didn't do the trials, you just did the sentencing. And that's all they would pay you for under the government payment thing. Somebody would do trials, but not all trials, a particular type of trial. That's all you would do, and that's all the government would certify you to be able to be paid for. And what she said was, it had detrimentally affected the UK bar in many ways. So she thought, she thought the generalists were by far the better thing, uh, but they were dying out in the UK. Georgia, what's your experience with that? I think as a baby, um, I've, I've said no to very little, to really nothing. I've always tried to say yes, because something that's important to me is um, getting time on my feet. Um, so being able to have time in court, because as a civil baby, um, barrister, it's very hard to, to get up in court. You're generally um, acting as a junior to a, a senior junior or to a silk. And your role in court is to you know, know, have an encyclopedic knowledge of the case and the, the brief and be able to assist, you know, in like administratively and make sure and you also like draft um, submissions and things like that, but you're not up on your feet. So for me, um, saying no to like maybe a DP trial in the magistrate's court or a um, 102 MA hearing in the family court or those types of trials, I'll, I will very rarely turn my head down because I just, um, I really want to get in my feet and get the advocacy experience. But I think um, that will change potentially next year and I'll have to start saying no because other work will start coming in and that's when you have to prioritise, I guess, um, prioritise, I guess, the money that you will get as a junior in a three-week trial as opposed to three DP hearings where you have time on your feet, but you'll be paid much, much less than you would be. Um, and, and you get extremely valuable experience as a junior in a three-week trial as well. That's, I'm not saying anything about that. It's just, um, I guess, as a junior today, we don't have the cash and badge cases that, mm. that I think you, you two may have had, so it's very hard to actually get the time. Um, I, I think you do need, sometimes you'll get a case where you know I'm not the right person for yeah. the job. I'm outside of the line. Yeah, uh, in my first year at the bar, no doubt a mate thinking he was doing the right thing sent me a defence brief for a guy who'd bitten somebody's ear off <laughs> in a caravan park. And I can remember the brief coming in, there's this photo of an ear on the ground with these ants on the outside <laughs> trying to drag it away. And I thought, no, I'm not the right person to do this. Because if the guy got convicted, he was gonna do some serious time. So I, I was able to flick that to a guy who did my bar course <coughs> who was interested in criminal. 
and he had a background in criminal. He won the case. Um, it set him, set him on his way to being a very successful criminal barrister. But if I'd done it, I'm certainly not sure that I would have won the case because I didn't think it was my job to start sort of experimenting in the area of criminal law where somebody was going to do serious time in jail if I made a mistake in it. So I generally haven't done crime because money's one thing, but deprivation of liberty is something quite different to that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's certainly my experience is when, you know, if, if you've got something in the magistrate's court, you do make some in the magistrate's court, you know, that's pretty up and down. But when you start talking about the, the higher courts, you know, the district court, Supreme Court, the Canada court, federal court, industrial court, land court, those sorts of planning court, there's a lot of law, L-O-R-E, about each of those areas of practice. And if you're on your own, if you're, if you're not being led by a senior barrister, which for most of them you're not, um, you just get yourself in trouble. So I would run a mile from a family brief because I'd trust. You know, there'd be some there'd be some practice direction that says you've got to do this certain thing, or there'd be some rule, and I would I would know the rule, and then everyone else who does it every day knows the rule, and so you find that in the lower courts, in the magistrates court, where it's a general general trial or just a basic you know a general assault or something like that, no worries. But when you start getting into these higher courts. There's a lot of L-O-R-E that, you know, you, you, you'll get yourself in trouble. And then Tom talks about ethical conundrums, and, and that's an example where you'll get yourself into an ethical conundrum, you know. You, you'll, you'll get your, you know, you'll do something wrong to your client's disadvantage, and then you go to, you know, say, so, well, do I have to disclose this to my client? What's my obligations here? Blah, 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 blah. And so, you're also putting yourself in a position where your reputation um, could be compromised in front of a judge and in front of other practitioners. So as yeah, definitely as Keith said, stay in your lane. But if you um, if you look at a brief and think, oh I, I can have a crack at that, I, I know enough about this and um, you know, and, you, and you've got a senior lane. barrister that says, yeah, yeah, I'll talk you through this. Absolutely. You know. Or a friend who who deals with those types of matters on a daily basis then I think yeah. Um, do we just time one last question? Um, so Firstly, well, this is a bit of a, a couple part question, but firstly, how itchy is the wig, first of all? Um, and are the wigs and robes here to stay? And going from that, what are the exciting developments in the bar going forward, um, if there are any? Uh, well, the wigs are very itchy. Very, very... I don't find them as itchy as I do. I find, well, <laughs> <laughs> So there's a ceremonial wig when you, you see that it comes down to here and it's horrendous. Um, I never bought it, I always borrow one. But uh, So I think at the moment with the last Chief Justice, she wanted the wigs to stay um, in trial division and so that's why they've, st they've certainly stayed. So there's a new Chief Justice. I'm not sure what her view will be. Certainly they've been phased out of the federal court, so now it's just robes in the federal court. And in the Court of Appeal, I think it's just robes. It's just robes. Magistrate's court is just robes. So in the trial division in the district court and, and in the Supreme Court, it's robes and wigs. Now, having said that, the individual judge controls their court. So you're starting a trial, and if the judge comes in and they're not wigged, you can just take off your wig and you'll you do it, and that's quite a common thing because they don't want to be wearing their wig either. Um, why is it important? Uh, I mean, you're all pretty young, so you won't remember this, but um, there was, was a series of bombings in the family court back in the 70s. And part of that was they moved, I mean, the person was obviously crazy, but they moved to a system where they de-robed and de-wigged, um, and that included the judge. And so uh, they used to come in, in, you know, female and male judges, just in ordinary suits or things like that. And part of the part of the feeling from that occurring was that the public started to perceive the judges as people and not part of the state, the if I can call it the executive, the larger state body. What robes do and what wigs do is it differentiates the person from their ordinary 
life as a citizen. So when they put it on, they're seen to be an instrument of the state. And I do think, or at least the feeling was coming out of those bombings, that it was important, particularly in the family court, which is a very difficult jurisdiction. You know, I've gone down there, I, I go down there periodically to do trust cases and corporations. I know all the judges down there, they're, they're lovely people, but it is a really hard jurisdiction. Um, it's important for them to be seen as instruments of the state. Um, and so I wouldn't want to see judges lose the robes. I definitely want to see the robes there so that people can see that they're not ordinary people and we don't get the types of incidents we had in the 70s. Um, exciting things happening with the bar. Uh, so we've got a new senior judge administrator, uh, Justice Glenn Martin. Um, he's really looking to do something with um, commercial litigation in the Supreme Court. Uh, so watch this space in the next year or so. Part of, I mean, there's a realisation with the judges that there's a, there's a strong invisible revenue for the state in having big litigation here um, because you have law firms, you've got barristers, they're all m making money that brings in money for the state. So you want to have a court system which is efficient and attractive for use. And I think there's a, there, there's a realization of that modernization where it's appropriate, streamlining the procedure where it's appropriate. And I know um, Justice Martin has got some really good ideas in that respect. And so we're already seeing a little bit of that. So there's a big trial on the moment that's been sitting almost for a year where they've got referees. So the judge has set it off to three referees. Two of those referees are senior ex-judges. One is a senior barrister. And they've been sitting on this almost like arbitrators. So part of it is the rules of evidence aren't applying in the hearings. The hearings, I think, have, they've sat for six months of continuous hearings, broken up into little bits. Um, so that's an example of big litigation. There's, I think, three silks on one side, three silks on the other. There's something like one side's got six juniors, the other side's got slightly less juniors, and then you've got a, a raft of people. Bringing that type of revenue into the state is a good thing and making, making our court sort of modern and efficient is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I think those, um, those developments have been really good. Mm -hmm. Arbitration is really, uh, I think, quite developed in the state. So we don't have a Singapore model where, you know, the state almost sponsors their arbitration center or really does sponsor their arbitration center. It's more ad hoc arbitrations, but there's a lot of it. And so if that's the type of work you're interested in, um, which is really, I find it quite interesting commercial work. There's a lot of that in Queensland now. And I think, you know, 15, 20 years ago, there wasn't. So there's, there's a lot more opportunities here than there were in the past. It's, it's a good time to be coming out of the law schools, I think. Great. Well, um, thank you, everyone. Please um, join me to, in thanking our guests um, for their time and inviting you.